Hi, I am Tarun Mittal, Consultant Cardiac Radiologist in London. In this session, I will take you through the basics of CT image display and reconstruction. We will try to understand how images are displayed, any CT images for that matter, on our viewing software, their orientation, etc. The concept of CT windows and what they mean. And we will try to go through the different reconstruction methods that are used to analyze and interpret the CT images. I will be demonstrating these concepts on a CT software and thus will be switching between the software and the slides. So we have different studies in this directory of a software called Vitria, uh, made by a company called Vital Images. I'm choosing one of the series from a patient labeled as A00A. Load the series in the software. So as I loaded the series, the images are displayed in different planes. So the plane to the bottom right is the axial plane. This is the plane in which the images have been actually acquired. As the image data is volumetric, the software is able to display them in other planes as well. So the plane on the top right panel is called the coronal plane. So this is a plane as if you're looking at the body from front of the patient. And the other plane that we see is called the sagittal plane. And this is the plane in which we're looking at the body from patient side, which could be from the right side or from the left side. Now let us focus on the axial plane and try to understand the orientation of these images. The display of images in axial plane on both CT and MRI scans is as if we are looking at the body from below, from the patient's foot end, in which case we have patient's right side on our left and patient's left side on our right. And these, the right and left orientation is generally labeled on the CT images. Similarly, we have the anterior aspect of the patient, if patient is lying supine, uh, upwards, and the posterior aspect of the patient, posteriorly or behind. If the anterior and posterior orientation is not labeled for any reason on the software, then we have to identify structures which are naturally present anteriorly or posteriorly. Like, for example, the sternum, um, is facing anteriorly while the spine is facing posteriorly and so on. Let us now try to understand the concept of CT density. So you can see on this image the different structures in the heart and around the heart are of different density or different brightness. So how does the CT software displays these in different densities, what does it mean? I'll go back to my slides to demonstrate this. Density of different structures on CT images is represented by Hounsfield unit, which is an arbitrary unit. A density of zero is given to clear fluid or water. Now fluids may be of different density, varying anywhere from 0 to 30, 40, depending how turbid the fluid is. For example, if it is an infected collection or hemorrhagic collection, it may have a density of 30, 40, even 50. Now, next higher density city would be that of soft tissue, so we, which is the muscles, for example, or the muscle of the heart, that's the myocardium. So the soft tissue density is generally in the range of 50 to 70 Hounsfield units. That more denser than that, we have the contrast in this uh, case in the cardiac chambers uh, in the aorta. So contrast density depends upon the density of contrast itself and the how fast the dense contrast has been given. And this range is anywhere from 200 to 600, 700. Now, further most dense materials in the body are the bones, the cartilages, and their density can be anywhere between uh, 500 to 2000, for example. Structures that are of less dense than water are fat, as see shown here, 
fat in the subcutaneous plane. This would have a density of minus 100 to minus 200. Its least dense tissue would be air. That would have a density of anywhere between minus 700 to minus 1000 or so. So different structures, different tissues have different densities assigned to them. And that's the way we differentiate between different tissues in the body on CT images. Let's now go back to the software. So we will try to understand different kinds of reconstructions we have on CT. <clears throat> As I said earlier, the images are acquired in the axial plane and then displayed in the coronal and the sagittal planes. These displays are also called multiplanar reconstructions or simply MPRs. Because the displays as coronal and sagittal planes are perpendicular to each other, these are also referred to as orthogonal MPRs. The softwares like this allow images to be displayed in different planes and able to scroll through them. And this we can do on any of the display images. Next, we will look at the oblique MPRs. Oblique MPRs are performed to evaluate a particular structure further in different planes. For example, if we wish to evaluate the aortic root further, which is the structure here, we would have to center the crosshair in the aortic root, then turn the crosshair to make one of the lines of the crosshair parallel to the aortic root and the other perpendicular to the aortic root. What we get on the opposite panel here is an oblique MPR, is also called the left ventricular outflow tract view, or on echo it's called the left parasagittal or parasternal view. And this is used to demonstrate the left ventricular outflow tract, the left atrium, left ventricle, and also the aortic root and aortic valve. We obtained this image by performing an oblique in a single plane, and hence this is called a single oblique. If you wish to further study the aortic valve in an aortic root in more detail, we may have to make an image that is perfectly aligned to the aortic root, in which case we can further align this parallel to the aortic root, parallel to the aortic valve and aortic root. In this case, in fact, if we look at the image here on the bottom right panel, we can see the three cusps of the aortic root symmetrically, and hence we don't have to further align. The image we have at the bottom right panel is a double oblique image through the aortic root. Another example of single and double oblique MPRs would be as follows. So let me reset these images and scroll to the center of the ventricles. Now I wish to create the cardiac axis views, the long and short axis views. So what I can do is to center, click in the center of the left ventricle align one of the crosshairs so it's passing parallel to the ventricular septum what i obtain is a two chamber long axis view through the left heart so this is example of a single oblique mpr if i wish to obtain a short axis view through the heart i would further click in the center of the mitral valve for example then align one of the crosshairs so that the right end of the crosshair is passing through the apex of the heart. Now what I have here on the top left panel is a short axis view, which is in fact a double oblique MPR. It is double oblique because first we aligned the image to the axial image here on the bottom right, followed by further aligning it, passing the image through the mitral valve and the apex to obtain a short axis view. So this is a good example of a double oblique MPR. Now in these images, in these 
displays, we can scroll again through the entire short axis view from the apex of the heart to the base of the heart, to the atria, etc. Study the different structures. Similarly, we can scroll through the four chamber view and study all the cardiac chambers and other structures. And similarly, on the long axis two chamber view, we can scroll through, look at the left heart and look at the right heart structures as well. So these are examples of the orthogonal and single and double oblique MPRs. Now the next type of MPR is called the curved MPR. So what do we mean by curved MPR and how do we obtain it? So now let us come to this particular display, which has been present since the beginning, but we have not yet uh, tried to label this or say what it means. So this is also in simple words called a 3D display. As you can see, it's got a depth element to it. It is also called volume rendered image as well. So I'm going to display this in one format. And now this software has already performed for us a curved MPR and I'm just going to show you what it looks like. So curved MPRs are performed through blood vessels like coronary arteries uh, in this case. And these are the MPRs that one needs to obtain through curved structures to evaluate them further in their long axis as well as their short axis. So let me zoom this up a bit and try to show you the entire length of this artery that the curved MPR has been drawn through. I can scroll through these MPRs both along their long axis as well as along their short axis. So these curved MPRs allow me to evaluate the wall of the coronary artery, if there are any plaques, for example, and also allow me to evaluate any stenosis in the coronary arteries. And this is perhaps the most powerful way on CT to evaluate the plaques and the stenosis in the coronary arteries. So this is an example of curved MPR. Now I'm going to explain to you the meaning of another kind of reconstruction, which is called maximal intensity projection or SMIP. Now these images that we are seeing are reconstructed as a slice thickness of 0.5 millimeter, which is displayed here in the bottom left corner of the image. We can see that the software also displays this thickness as 0.5 here. The minimal slice thickness that we can reconstruct and display on a CT software is determined by the, the thickness of the detector of the CT scanner that we have used to scan the patient. In this case, for the Toshiba scanner, the thinnest reconstruction it does and acquires the images on is 0.5 millimeter. Now, if we were to thicken these images to say 1.5, 2.5, 3.5, what we are doing is creating what is called as the MIP or maximum intensity projection images. You can thicken these images or make MIPs of any degree of thickness you wish, depending upon the purpose of the evaluation of the data. For the sake of coronary arteries, we generally stick to a MIP of between three to four millimeters. And my favorite position on this software is a thickness of 3.5 millimeter. And this is quite useful to evaluate the coronary arteries. I'm going to just reset this data to the orthogonal MPRs. And here you can see if you thicken the MIP to 3.5, for example, you are able to uh, look at the coronary arteries in a slightly thicker volume and go through them much faster than if you were looking at them at 0.5 millimeter native collimation. There are situations, however, when you need to evaluate the images on their thinnest possible collimation. And this happens when you are looking at uh, plaques and wanting to evaluate the degree of coronary artery stenosis.
and we will come to how to evaluate coronary artery plaques uh, in a later session. Next, we will look at the concept of image windowing. So here we have what is called as W slash L. W stands for window width and L stands for window level. And these images are currently being displayed at a window width of 1400 and a window level of 400. So what does these numbers mean? Let me go back to the PowerPoint presentation. CT window is nothing but the settings on the image that are used to optimally display the tissues that are of interest. For example, when we analyze the coronary arteries and structures of the heart, we would like to optimize the settings so that we can see these structures to their best. Now we describe the windowing in two, two parameters. One is the window level, which is nothing but the average density of the tissues that one is most interested in. And then second is the window width, which is the latitude or spread of the densities that we require. When we talk about a soft tissue window for the purpose of studying the heart, we would like to have the window level at somewhere between 50 to 400, which is the density of tissues, uh, which include the, the myocardium, includes the contrast in the uh, coronary arteries and the ventricles, example. And we can take the average Hounsfield units of 200 to represent that level at which most of these structures we are interested in would be at. Then the window width we'll choose would be, say, at around 1,000. Now, 1,000 is the spread around the two valley window level of 200 that we will be able to see on the this particular soft tissue setting. So a value or a width of 1,000 Hounsfield units will represent a value of 500 or half of 1,000 below 200 Hounsfield units, which is minus 300 and 500 above 200, that is 700 Hounsfield units. So that will be the latitude of the densities that a uh, window width will allow, a window width of 1000 would allow us to use. So as a standard, I prefer to use a window level of 200 and a window width of 1000 to display the cardiac images. Now there are situations when the scan may have high contrast density, may have a lot of calcium, or there are stents or clips in the patient's coronary arteries. In which case, you would prefer to use a higher window level of say 400 compared to the normal 200 and a wider window width of 1400 to display the structures and the contrast more clearly. The other window that one uses commonly is the lung window. Now, as we know, the air in the lung is of much lower density. So here, the ideal window level to use is minus 500 Hounsfield units, and the window width is 1500 Hounsfield units. And this allows us to use see the lungs optimally. These are the two most commonly used windows. Then there are other windows that one can use, like such as a bone window to look at the rib cage, the uh, spine, etc. This comes to the end of our session. I hope you have understood the concepts of image display on CT software, how and what windowing means on CT, as well as different kinds of reconstructions that are used in practice for analyzing and interpreting cardiac CT images. Thank you for your attention.